Hey guys, welcome to System Design Fight Club, live every Saturday at 6 p.m. PST and 10.30 p.m. PST. Uh, today we're going to be covering sending batch promotional emails. Uh, I have a collection of some links that were useful for uh, trying to research how to cover this problem. Um, the specification for this is going to be, we want to send 1 million emails in 10 minutes. Um, yeah. Are you guys able to see the links all right? Can you, can you read this okay? Okay, I'm going to assume that's fine. All right, let's go ahead and, oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks for confirming. Yeah, I got feedback a couple of times that uh, the text was um, too small. Okay, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, we want to cover the functional requirements. And we want to cover the non-functional requirements. So for the functional requirements, um, send a bunch of emails, a high volume of emails, a very high volume of emails. Uh, uh, they follow a template. Uh, we want analytics on whether or not they actually click the emails. Okay, um, and um, you actually cannot do exactly once delivery. There was nice info on that in uh, the link right here, um, which I found in Al Shu's first book. Um, and so for this problem, you're actually going to want to do um, at most once delivery. But I'll also do a variation to show you guys how to do at least once delivery as well. Um, and that is, I think that's a functional requirement. I'm also going to list it over here, though. Um, we want to do, um, how do I put this? It's like we want to have the least amount of email drops as possible. Um, failed sends. I, actually, that's how I'll word it. Failed email sends as possible. Uh, that relies on um, availability. That's going to require a lot of, um, it's, it's a high availability is, is kind of a uh, requirement for this. Is um, kind of important. Um, yeah, I guess that's, yeah, I can't, I, I don't know how else to describe some of these things. Um, I, I think this is just what we have for this. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, numbers, uh, we have um, 1 million uh, emails to send, uh, send them all in under 10 minutes. Okay, and so uh, we're going to want to know the TPS, and I also want to know what the bandwidth is. One of those is, uh, it's for figuring out what's our, our constraint here, what's, what's, uh, what's constraining us. Are we going to be CPU bound, bandwidth bound? Um, what's our bound here? So uh, um, how many emails per second? We have um, one. Well, okay, uh, we want how many emails per second and uh, what's the bandwidth? Oh, I forgot another number is that we are taking an average of 50 kilobytes per email. I actually took that from Alex Shu's book on uh, the attributed email service from book two is um, 50 kilobytes uh, per email, including all the metadata, but no attachments. So if there's like a PDF or something, that's a couple of megabytes. We're just gonna leave that off. We're gonna assume these are, these uh, emails are not going to be sent with the attachment. That would actually make sense too, is, is um, you would prefer to have an approach where um, if there's some kind of big document, you want them to do stuff in the email and click a link in order to see the big PDF. Otherwise you're gonna, a lot of this is just gonna be trash that like nobody opens. So you'd rather um, not be sponging up all that bandwidth 
that might just go to um, that might not actually reach anybody's eyeballs. And so if they actually click the link to see the, you know, 20 or 50 megabyte attachment, um, I would, I would you'd prefer that to be buried in a link, I think, instead of sending it with the email. So 50 kilobytes per email. And I actually did go through my own emails. And I verified that is actually pretty accurate. Uh, some of them were actually 100 kilobytes uh, with without any attachments whatsoever. Um, I think that's all the numbers I need, though. Okay, so uh, how many emails per second? We have um, 1 million, and we're going to divide it by 10 times uh, 60 seconds in a minute. Um, so that is 1, 000, uh, 1 million divided by um, 600. Um, 333, 600. We, we, you know what? Let's 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 round it down to 500. We're going to do 1 million uh, divided by 500. Uh, so that will be equivalent to. Um, Remove two zeros from both. So that would be 10,000 divided by five, which is 2,000. So we have about 2,000 emails per second. Awesome. OK, so what's the bandwidth? So we have um, 2,000 emails per second, and it's uh, 50 kilobytes per email. Um, so we're going to do 2,000. Uh, times uh, 50 kilobytes, and then I'll get uh, per second uh, bandwidth. Um, so that will be um, 10, uh, let's, let's say 20, it's the same thing as 20,000 times five, which is 100,000 kilobytes per second. Um, and that is kilobytes. So we can say it's 100 megabytes per second, um, or about 0 0.1 megabytes bytes per second. I'm converting it to gigabytes because I think it's reasonable to have a one gigabit um, bandwidth on a, just like your own residential uh, internet connection, you can easily get a one gigabit connection. So 0 0.1 gigabytes per second is 0 0.8 gigabits per second, which is still less than one. And then um, 1.0 gigabits per second is reasonable for one machine's bandwidth on its internet connection. So it would look like from the uh, what our bandwidth that we can get away with just one machine, but keep in mind we're doing 2,000 TPS here. Um, so that's I can put that in parentheses here. Is that's that's our that's our TPS is 2,000. Um, so I've never seen anything that can actually handle that kind of TPS on a single machine. So I think um, we're actually going to be a bit more um, core bound. It's, it's CPU bound. Uh, you're, you're, uh, so um, the issue here is that uh, every time you're making a request, it occupies a single core on a CPU. And so um, you only have so many CPUs on a machine. And um, while handling one request, you can't have any other requests occupying that core of the machine. You only have 16 cores on the machine. And so um, we can go ahead and do the math on this is, is um, how many requests that we're going to be handling per core and then how many seconds it will be sitting on the core. And you'll see that it's, it's um, we're, we're probably going to need more cores than that. So it's um, 2000 requests per second. And then um, let's say we have 16 cores to a CPU. We can say 16 to 64. Let's start with 16, though. So that would be 2,000 divided by 16. We have, um, then it would be 500 divided by 4, which comes out to 125 requests per second for each core. And then if we have, we have 64 cores, then we would have, uh, we can divide that by four again. So let's say, let's round that down to uh, 120, 60. So then we would have 30 requests per second for each core. Um, I think 64 cores would be, a, that's, that's like if you're doing like really computationally expensive stuff, you can definitely get something like that from AWS. 
So I think 16 cores is probably more realistic if you're going to be doing this problem. So we would say we have um, 100 TPS per core. And so then uh, you're handling 100 transactions per second on each course. That's 1,000 milliseconds for 100 requests. And so then each request can only occupy a core for 10 milliseconds at that rate. I think that's unrealistic. I don't think you can actually get a request on and off the core in under 10 milliseconds. So that's why I'm saying that we're core bound. I'm putting in caps lock. I shouldn't be doing that. And you can actually escape this by using something called the continuation passing style, but it's very rare to ever see that implemented because it makes your code um, very, it, it makes your, it, it's, it's like an optimization trick and it's, it's, you don't want to do that. It's, um, really makes your code a lot more complicated. Um, but that is one way to get around the, the one request per core binding. Um, it's, it's a one trick I've, I've never actually seen it used in practice. Um, but we're probably going to be core bound here. So I don't think we can actually get away with, um, uh, one machine. I think we're, we're likely going to need, um, like probably 10, I, I think 100 milliseconds per request is probably reasonable. And so then that would be at least 10 machines. Um, all right, let's go ahead and hop into the diagrams though now. Um, so we are going to have, um, we're going to have a user database. We're gonna have at least something like that. Some data store for the users. Uh, we're gonna, I wanna, we're gonna have message brokers. We're gonna have task runners for sure. Um, so these will be, um, task runners, um, for sending the emails. So we're going to have some task runners for sending the emails, uh, and I want to feed the data to them off a broker. So we're going to have a message broker here. We are going to have, um, there'll be, um, Okay, Let, let's maybe start with, with um, from the browser of, we're gonna have some kind of um, marketing person, some marketing analysts browse, uh, some marketing analysts browser. And uh, they're gonna make a call to some kind of backend. It'll be the batch emailing service. It will not actually handle the batch email sending. It'll be, uh, this is just where you kick off a request for doing a huge um, batch email. Um, so you have a request go in, hey, I wanna send all these emails. This will say back, yep, all right, gotcha. Um, so it's going to, um, we, we don't want to focus on this too much. I usually do start a lot with the, the browser aspect, but we specifically want to focus on how we're going to get 1 million emails sent. Um, and so we're going to have um, some kind of map reduce job or some kind of batch job that is going to, um, it'll also have task runners over here. Um, and it is going to take messages. Uh, so it, this is, this person is going to say, Hey, I want to send all these emails to, you know, 1 million users. It's going to get those users and their information from the uh, user DB. Uh, and we're going to put them onto the message broker. We'll use a stream, something like Kafka, maybe Kinesis. I think a stream is a good idea here since we're going to have a higher scale. Um, okay, so we're going to have Kafka. Okay, and then we have the task runners over here for actually sending the emails. Um, I delete the text. Okay. So here's the task runners for sending the emails. We have Kafka. Uh, this is mainly where I want to focus on on uh, the design for today is 
we, we got these things coming in and then we're gonna have these task runners that are gonna send the emails and it's gonna be at most one semantics as we covered up here in the non-functional requirements. Okay, so you're gonna have this task runner. It's gonna pull a message. It's gonna pull something off of Kafka. Whoops, I don't want that. I want one of these. We're going to pull a message off of Kafka. And then um, we are going to have, um, There's a bunch of different uh, things we're going to need to pull data into. So it's it's a templated email, and you're going to have stuff like the person's full name. You're going to have maybe uh, some uh, analytical IDs, some UUIDs on the links you're going to put into the email. Um, there'll be a bunch of stuff that you have to get from a bunch of different data sources. Um, you can either pre-process this or, or post-process the thing into the template. But um, for now, we're going to do it post-processed. Um, I should maybe explain this a little bit is, um, why do we have this 10 minute, uh, thing? It's, um, one, one purpose could be, uh, yeah. So why 10 minutes, um, it could be for the convenience of the marketing users. Maybe they just don't want to wait a whole day to see all the email sent. Second reason could be to, to, um, highlight the, the traffic impact that you're seeing off of um, user response to the emails. If you have it uh, distributed over a whole day, if you send all the emails over the course of an entire day, then you're not gonna see as clear of a uh, the, 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 like reacting spike to all the emails. If you have all the emails sent within this little 10 minute window, then they're all gonna get it at the same time and you'll see them uh, reacting over the next several hours and starting to click it. You'll see that impact on, the, on your, your uh, website that you're trying to drive them to. Um, act of your marketing campaign. Okay, um, so there's going to be probably some data stores that you're going to want to aggregate from. This is going to have a really messy partial failure scenario. Um, and we're definitely going to deep dive that. So you are going to want to aggregate some data together from a bunch of different data sources. And then we're gonna have this external service, which is the, the email provider, external email, which is where you're gonna actually send it to. And then you only want to send it at most once. So normally when you have it set up like this with a broker, it'll do retries, but you want to do at most once. So we're also going to have a notification database. Let's center that. That's really bugging me. Okay, so this is going to track the notifications and whether they're sent or not. It's like the, the status of the um, of each notification coming from over here. Um, we should maybe talk about the format a little bit of the messages coming in. It'll be, you'll have a user ID. Whoops, so now we actually don't want it centered. We want it like that. We have a user ID, which will look like this, one, two, three, four. And we'll also have a campaign ID. It's a marketing campaign ID. It should be like five, six, seven, eight. Um, so that'll be on the broker over here. And then we're gonna put those into the notification tracker. And then we're not, this is gonna be our, our thing for making sure that we don't do double sends. So the, the flow for the task runner is going to be like this one, um, check if uh, you already um, handled the message, two, if not, mark it as handled. This is the part that can move, um, three, send the email. And then four, 
I feel like, so this is not something that I've seen done a lot, but it's like, um, what is the, um, how many of them are, are successfully sent? So it, it's, it's, a uh, if you have it fail after, you could have it fail after two, and then it's not actually going to retry. So that's how we get at most once. Um, because first it's going to check this thing. It's going to do a read and check if it's already in there. And then um, we're going to want to aggregate all our, our information before marking it as handled, because um, that's where we have a big opportunity. That's that's where we have um, a lot of uh, other opportunity for um, the node, the the worker node, to fail and um, lose all our progress so far. Um, so two. And then um, at, uh, we, we want to put off marking it as handled to write before sending the email. So this is that's the part that's interesting is um, marking as handled and then you send the email. And that's how we do at most once. If you want to do at least once, you just flip the ordering of these two. And then five, um, we can have a second event. Uh, this this is totally optional, but it's um it's like you might want to have analytics on um just how many you actually get dropped right between three and four, um and so this will help you with that is um mark uh so um this one is more as um attempting to send. And so we'll give this one a status as um, attempt. And then the other one is uh, success. And um, when you're checking it, if you see attempt, you actually cannot try to send again. Um, so like they'll 99% of the emails will likely have success on them. Um, but ninety nine percent will have success, but one hundred percent of them will have attempt. At least one hundred percent of them will make it all the way through attempt. And then, um, with at most once is that so we only want to send an email if we haven't gotten to the attempt step before. And then, um, we we're not going to look at the success part. And so there's the one percent of emails that actually like dropped before they got to success, but we actually don't want to retry those because it might fail after the send. Uh, you could have your node fail either before four, right between three and four, it could fail between four and five. And so that's why you don't want to retry on a, uh, you don't want to retry if, um, if this isn't showing. It's You only want to retry if this is not showing because that guarantees that you've not already possibly gotten through step four. Uh, that, that's what we're trying to prevent with um, at most ones is that we want to, we want to um, make sure that we don't, do this twice. Yeah, so if you, you can just flip these two if you want to do at least one semantics instead. Okay, and I'm going to label those on the chart is um, so we have uh, one, pull the message off. Oh. And then seven is update the offset. Okay, so one, pull it off. Um, two, we're going to do the read. Uh, so that is number two, the read. Uh, three, we're going to do the aggregation of all the data. So this one is number three. We're going to have number three over here. This is the same even if we have if we have five different calls over here, if it's two, five, 23, you know, any number, we're going to do all the aggregation before um, step number four. We want to leave four as late as possible, but it has to come right before five with that most one semantics. Okay, and then we're going to do the mark over here for step four. And that comes right before number five, which is the sin. And then there will, of course, be a browser over here. 
for uh, the um, customers. They will be using um, their own email provider. Um, well, you're sending it to their email provider service. So that's like Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo. So they're actually getting their emails off of this. So they're going to you know, load up their, their um, email on their browser. And that's actually what we're using here. Okay. Um, and you can also do number six as well as another right. Uh, that could actually be a different data store. Uh, it could be the same one. You can do um, event sourcing. Um, yeah, I guess we can go ahead and have it on the same one. And um, that one's, this is totally optional. I just like it because then it gives you, um, it's it's really good uh, metrics. We're actually having a bit more insight into how often you get a dropped email that never went through. Um, it, it definitely would not be, it's not guaranteed to be 100% accurate, but it gives you an upper bound on how many emails might have just not even gone through five at all. Okay, um, and then we're going to do the update on offset. I think you guys understand how that will work. Um, any questions on this before I try to deep dive into anything else? Okay, um, so I can deep dive into the schema on the notification tracker DB a bit more. Um, I'm actually still not sure if I actually want to have these rights on the same one because that does make it a little bit confusing for um, the read lookup. Um, let's start for now and just kind of see how it works out. Um, so we're going to want to track the user ID and we want to track the uh, campaign ID. That's kind of our primary key. Um, that's how that's that's what we're going to be checking on the read is does this already exist? So we have the user ID and we're gonna have the campaign ID. Okay, and then um, we could just kind of have the status and I guess we could update that. We could just have a status of, um, it'll just be attempt or it could be um, success. We'll call it attempted. I, I like attempted a lot more. You cannot attempt again if you've already attempted once before. That's 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 how I'll put this. Um, I, I I probably worded this whole chunk between four and six really confusingly. Um, I like the word attempted probably clear probably is a much more clear way to communicate that. Um, you cannot attempt to see send the email again if you have attempted it at least once already, and then success just gives us uh, a, a nice upper bound on how many um, failed on the attempt. Yeah, I think that works. Um, I guess that works. Uh, so what kind of database would we want? How do we want to shard this? Um, how is this going to work out? Um, so uh, I guess it would not, I, I think it's probably about balance. This is not going to be so off balance that you would say that it's right heavy. Um, I would say that it's, so we do have two rights here. Six was optional, but even, so it's it's um even with both I'd, I'd say it still is roughly balanced and so B tree is probably good enough. Uh, uh, write heavy is when you have like one a one to one hundred ratio of reads to rates or something. I I think is when you would like really want to use an LSM tree. So um, I think DynamoDB uh, with uh, strong read consistency. So you really want strong read consistency because um, again, you don't want to try to, it, it, it's, uh, you can't use eventual consistency when um, for the check on uh, uh, number two. If you're using eventual consistency, then um, you might see stale data. And so then you might be like, oh, it looks like we haven't actually um, handled this message. I don't see it in the database. And if it's because it's, it's stale, well, it might actually be written there. So that's why you need strong read consistency. Um, 
So that works. Um, I don't know what other databases would probably be good for achieving sufficient consistency. I, I mean, Spanner is like another option, but it's really expensive. Um, I think DynamoDB with strong read consistency is probably going to do the job. Um, how are we going to shard this thing? How are we going to shard this thing? Well, so you're going to have one campaign going on at a time. So you can't use this as the partitioning ID. This, this definitely is not going to be how you're going to partition it. Um, I think you would maybe want to partition it by the user ID. Um, so partition over this. And then I guess you could use the campaign ID as the sort key. Yeah. That was actually really straightforward. You're not really going to get a hot partition issue with the user IDs here um, because it's it's like these are promotion emails. Maybe you have a user that just checked all the boxes for all of your promotions, but it's not going to be so outsized that it's like, you know, Elon Musk versus, you know, um, your brother's Twitter account or something on, on Twitter where, you know, Elon has 1 million followers and, you know, you or your brother has... 10 or 100 followers. So you're not really going to get a hot partition issue off the user ID, but you will definitely get a hot partition off of um, the campaign ID because you do those one at a time. And so you kick off campaign and then just for the next 10 minutes, it's purely one specific campaign going on. And if you partition over that, that means just one single partition, one, one shard, one node of your, your database is just going to get hosed for those 10 minutes. And that'll be a latency issue and it can result in uh, poor availability. Yeah, okay, I guess that was a little bit easier than expected. Um, I can talk through, uh, going through this again with a pre-compute approach instead, where you just try and um, instead of having, uh, uh, the, the issue here is is um, you really wanna have this after that, because what if one of these nodes is down? You don't wanna mark it, and then you do all your aggregation because if one of these is down, that means that if it if it's a little bit more flaky, then you're going to get a much uh, a much lower. Uh, you're going to have a lot more failures on your sins. You're going to have a lot more attempts that fail. You want to put all the the, the work that can be flaky um, ahead of the attempts. Um, so another approach is that we could try and just do a pre-compute, and then um, I, I don't think that would actually make a difference um, on this little section. This is this is the high risk section right here is um, the send itself, which has the at most semantics. Um, yeah, I guess I could kind of go through how the pre-compute would work, but if it's again with our scenarios, there was two um, highlighting the impact of your marketing campaign versus convenience for marketing users. And if it's, if you're, uh, if you're doing pre-compute, then it's not really going to be for the convenience of the, mar the marketing users, because you're adding, um, extra steps, extra transformations, possibly, um, it might be a longer path overall, but if you're just trying to highlight the impact of your marketing campaign, I guess it might make sense to just go ahead and pre-compute it all. And then you just do one batch send at a specific time. Um, so uh, we can go through a couple of scenarios and it, it might clarify why, again, why this might make sense is that there's, um, uh, you could have amazon.com uh, that shows product recommendations, which are tailored to, you know, you as opposed to a different person. And then there's also stuff where it's um, a, uh, a magazine telling you to subscribe. So this second one is not really going to have as much um, tailoring specific to you. So it's a lot less computationally expensive as opposed to the product recommendations where you've got like a data model running against each individual one. So that's going to be a lot of compute run against each individual user while the second one is just like, hey, you've got this template and you're just injecting, you're just doing little string injections instead. So um, uh, that's really low in terms of computational expense. But if you're doing something like this and you have scenario two up here, um, I'll go ahead and highlight that. You might want to do some pre-compute if it's... Um... But if it was just um, convenience for marketing users and you had um, a magazine telling you to subscribe, uh, 
pre computing doesn't make sense in this flow, works totally fine. Okay. And, um, you know, I'm going to copy paste this so that I can explain, I can have this for, um, this one is, this one is with, um, at most, at most once semantics. And then this one is going to be least once semantics. And you're just going to flip these. And so that that has a risk of having um, it's it's a uh, if you have the aggregations right there that is um, you, you still might want to have a two step thing oh okay okay if you have at least one semantics oh we can keep it the same way and then it just varies in terms of the retry where what you would um what mess what status you would use for the, the retry. So we could actually keep it the same way. And so then um, check if you've already handled the message. Um, so uh, retry if it doesn't say success. And so then you have to get all the way through um, step six uh, in order to ensure that it doesn't you while and, and to ensure that it, it um, you have to get through six uh, to prevent a retry from occurring. Well, over here, you just want to get through four. And so check if you already handled is just going to go for uh, retry if it doesn't say tempted. There. Okay, let's go ahead and try the, um, are, are there any questions before I try to do the pre-compute workflow? All right, uh, we can go ahead and take a shot at that and I'm going to highlight all of this. Let's zoom in. Okay, so this is going to be interesting. Um, I want to like make this like text object that we're going to stick in an S3 bucket. Another approach is that we, so it, it's just three that we're trying to um, get into this like thing for the pre-compute, I think mainly. You can, either, you can either make the whole email text itself and stick that as the out the, the thing you want pre-computed or you can just have the aggregated data into a JSON blob for their pre-compute. Um, I don't want to cover both. We'll just stick with the S3 with, with one where it's the whole text blob that's pre-computed. Um, okay, so you would have all these user IDs that you want to cover and then we're going to take all of this. Let's go ahead and shift that over. Okay, so you're still going to need some task runners and it's over here. It's the task runners for aggregating data. Check if message is already handled. Do you, you we have the message ID to track this? It's, uh, we're gonna check off the user ID and campaign ID. It's the primary key. The, the primary key is basically getting passed through the, um, the message broker. This is what we're deduping off of is, is the pair. Um, I think it might be easier just to have a, a message ID might make it a bit more. Um, yeah, because if the forward. user wants to send um, a similar campaign, right? For a similar campaign, let's say, uh, not a user, an administrator, right? Like so maybe mm -hmm. 10 minutes down the line, then we might be able to find the previously one and think that it was a success, isn't it? Like if you don't have a message. Um, so if, if they run another campaign, I, I'd, I'd want each time they want to send an email to have a different campaign ID. 
So it's, oh, it's I yeah, I, I don't want them to try to like, it's like, okay, I had this one template I was using. I'm going to resend that exact same template. I would, I would expect them to have a different campaign ID. So you could even have, um, so when you're running a campaign, uh, you would have maybe a template ID that goes with it. So we could even, um, that could even be part of the aggregating step is that you want to fetch the, the template itself is that you have, um, you would have a campaign ID five, six, seven, eight, and you would have um, templates ID of, um, let's say, uh, six, 67. And then we would have another campaign ID come down uh, later on. And it's um, 5682. Uh, and they're just going to reuse that same template ID. 67. Um, so every time you want to send a batch of emails, it should have a new campaign ID. Um, yeah, good question. So that, that's how we're going to do that. Do do. Sorry, what were you going to say? No, I just said got it. Yeah, I think yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Good call out, though. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Task run. So we're actually going to do the aggregating over here. Uh, whoops. And then we're going to have this like S3 bucket or something of the emails that we want. Okay, so this is. Uh... S3 bucket, and we're going to have um, some kind of key, uh, message key, uh, message UUID. And it'll be some long thing. And uh, it'll have um, the blob. Uh, it will just be some massive um, text blob. I blank, please accept our credit card offer, something like that. Um, and then we're going to pass that UUID down through. We're going to have another message broker. And then this one will have, still need to have the user ID, have the campaign. Oh, we could just go ahead and switch straight over to the message UUID, I think. Um, and so then we'll have this instead. Okay. Um, and then I guess that would change over here. How we're deduping it is that instead we could just check the message UUID or I, I, I don't know if we actually need the user, user ID. We could have the message UUID is associated with um, the user ID and the campaign ID. And so each of these is going to be unique. And then we don't even... Okay, I, I like the message ID approach a lot. Let's let's go ahead and stick a lot more to using that as the primary key instead. Um, so we're just going to use the message UUID. So we're going this is going to be our our object store. We're going to have a message object store, and then we also want to have a metadata store for these objects. And so we can have um, this and then we also want to have um, another one for the message metadata store and we'll also write it over to there this whole thing's going to be item potent so we don't care as much about um, exactly once versus um, at least one semantics this thing's item potent. Um, the only thing where we can't do item potent stuff is on the send itself, just this one little step. So this thing's fine. And then uh, we have this data store over here, which will have the message UUID and it'll map it to the user ID. Um, uh, 
Oh, shoot. Whoops. And we will have the And then the task runner will still need to do all that instead of aggregating all the data in step three, you just do a read off of um, object store for number three. Okay, and then this would reduce the amount of risk you'd have for this whole operation. Having it, it should make this whole operation go faster if you do the pre-computing. Um, but all the risk of having uh, failed email sends that just don't get sent at all for the at most one semantics occurs um, just right here in this little chunk right here. So this doesn't actually do anything for. Um, improving our, our email um, success sent rate at all. It, it just means that this little chunk is going to go faster. Um, if you have a bunch of um, email campaigns that reuse some stuff, like for example, if amazon.com keeps recommending uh, the same items over and over, um, then I guess that might be useful. Or if those uh, those little processes happen independently, the, the product recommendations uh, mining might happen separately from the um, marketing analyst deciding to do a batch send. Like for example, you could have um, a order confirmation email from Amazon.com. They're like, "Hey, we've received your order. It'll it'll arrive in two days." And then at the bottom of that email could also have product recommendations. And so then doing that pre-computing might also help a little bit there. Um, but this is just another alternative approach with um, pre-processing. I, I don't know if it actually makes a lot of sense here, but I'm sure some people would be interested in seeing that as well. So I did it. Um, all right, any other questions for this? Anybody have any questions on this? All right, I think we can go ahead and wrap it up early. Uh, thanks everyone for showing up. Um, yeah, you guys are free to drop off early. Thanks for coming. See ya. Thank you.